Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. An Oklahoma rancher and farmer, Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. Okay, well, it's good to see everybody with us this afternoon. And again, we're just going to uh, come right back into our study of the Scriptures. And for those of you joining on the television, we'd like to welcome you to just an informal Bible study. We uh, have no particular denomination grind, uh, axe to grind. We just hope that we can get everybody, regardless of your background, to search the Scriptures and to learn to read them and enjoy them and to study them on your own. That's what the book was made for. You know, I use the, the uh, expression so often that Tyndale used when he was trying to get the New Testament, especially in the Bible, into England. And I'm going to keep using it because I think it says it all. He wanted a copy of the Scripture in the hands of every plowboy in England. And I want you to know that. Well, if he wanted them in the hands of every plowboy in England, then why in the world doesn't everybody in a place like America search the Scriptures and read them and enjoy them? And I, I think there is a resurgence of interest to a certain degree. I, I have to believe that. All right, now, oh, I guess I should also mention that all the past programs are available in videotapes, audios, and the printed books, and uh, you write to us or call us, and we'll get you the information for that. Okay, we've got a lot of ground to cover in a few moments, so let's turn straight back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, we've been talking about the judgment of the unbeliever. In case you're wondering, why am I coming from Revelation back to 2 Corinthians? And Revelation 20, in our last program, we were dealing with the great white throne judgment where every unbeliever of all the ages will come before Christ, the judge, not the Savior, and not only will they realize that their name was never in the Lamb's Book of Life, but they're going to have all of the record of their evil deeds put before them. God's going to have a record, the books. Well, there will be no believers at the great white throne, so where will believers be judged for their works? We're, we're not going to escape that. And so that's why I'm bringing you back now to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, because Paul, of course, is the one that has to lay out that which is in the future for us as especially church-age believers. And yes, we are going to stand before Christ to give a record or account of our deeds and works as believers. Now again, let me emphasize. No believer's sin will be presented to him at the Bema Seat. This will be strictly a review of our works as believers, and there will be no dealing with our sin. Now remember that. Why? Because they were paid for at the cross. All our sin was judged on Christ at the cross. We will never have to stand before God and give an account for our sin but we will give an account with what we have done as believers. And it is called the judgment seat in the King James, and I think it's unfortunate because the Greek word is bema, just as plain as day. And the bema seat, of course, if you go to the ancient city of Corinth, where we were a couple years ago, and it's a platform just all oh, about 12, 18 inches high, and that's all it was, was a raised platform where a decree of judgment would be handed out, or as I think Paul uses the term, in the Olympics, the seat of the judges was a raised platform where the judges would determine who won first, second, third in the races and so forth. But whatever, the Bema seat was just simply a place where the person in authority would make the decree. All right, now that's what we have here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Jump in with me, if you will, down at Verse 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll begin at verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, that is, in this body of flesh, we are absent from the Lord. Well, that's certainly logical, isn't it? While we're here, we're not with Him. 
we're in the body. Now he is with us in the person of the Holy Spirit, of course, but we are not in his presence, we're here in the body. All right, verse seven. For we walk by what? Faith, faith. And you know, I don't see how in the world anybody can preach an evangelistic sermon and never use the word faith, but they do. And it's utterly impossible to have any kind of a salvation without faith. Remember one of the absolutes I'm always using back in Hebrews? Without faith it is impossible to please God. And so here again, Paul makes it so plain that while we are absent from Christ and we're present in this body, we do not walk with Him visible in our eyes, but we walk by faith. We walk by believing what He has given us in His Word. All right, let's move on to verse 8. So we are confident, he says, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now again, let's look at Paul's circumstances. The poor man had been suffering now for years because of his apostolic work. The Judaizers were constantly after him, trying to destroy his work. In time, the pagan Romans began to come down upon Christianity. We know that Paul suffered a martyr's death because of his work with the gospel. But on top of all that, he was suffering sickness. He had suffered pain from the beatings and the scourgings and so forth. And then with the increasing pressure from the Roman authorities against Christianity, I can see where Paul was anxious to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. I'll, just this morning, Iris and I were looking at a, a little film clip of, of various places around the world where there's such tremendous need. Areas of Russia, areas of uh, the Arab world where Christians are under terrible persecution. And then you go into the areas of the third world where it's abject poverty and she and I witnessed it in Haiti ourselves. Abject poverty, no hope of ever coming out of it in spite of anything that the UN or anybody else can do. They can never begin to touch the needs of these masses of people who have absolutely nothing of this world's goods. And I remember talking to the Haitian Christians. What was their only hope? That the Lord would come because they'll never get out of it any other way. And so as we were looking at these poor benighted souls this, this morning on, on this film clip, I, I couldn't help but say the same thing. If only the Lord would come. But you see, we in America have got it so good. My, we've got it so good and we enjoy life to such a full extent that we really don't hanker for this like the apostle did. Now we should, because even as good as we've got it, What's up there is going to be far, far better. But nevertheless, understand where the apostle is coming from. He's suffering. He has had sickness nigh unto death. And the persecution is increasing. And no wonder he could say, oh, it's so much better to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. All right, then the next verse, verse 9. Wherefore, wherefore, he says, we labor. As believers, wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, see, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. Now that's not salvation. This is not salvation. Are we being pleasing to Him as a child of God? And I like to bring it into the, into the earthly, the physical analogy. My, when you're parents and you've got maybe two, three, four offspring, as long as they're all obedient and they're all more or less, uh, what shall I say, in conformity to your wishes as parents, hey, that's a happy circumstance, isn't it? But how many times there may be one or possibly two of those siblings that become renegades, they become belligerent, they become antagonistic. What does it do to the parent? Well, it leaves them with a heartache. Well, with God, it's the same way. God has paid the purchase price of our redemption. We're His, 
and he would certainly wish that we would do his bidding, but he's not going to force it. He is not going to force it. And so what's the, what's the incentive then for believers to be pleasing in his sight? Reward. We do the same thing with our kids, don't we? We give them the incentive to maybe do well at school or to do these things and to be obedient. We give them incentives and we'll reward that response. All right, now it's the same way here. All right, look what he says. Therefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him, not for salvation, but that we can hear his, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and then lay out the rewards. Next verse, verse 10. For we as believers now, remember the unbelievers are going to be judged at the great white throne as we saw in another program. But we as believers must all appear before the Bema seat. Now I think the word judgment, I don't know how in the world the translators got it because I know the Greek says plain as day, the Bema seat. And we must all appear before the Bema seat of Christ, which is that seat of the judges, see? that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he hath done, be it good or bad. Now that's not salvation. This is strictly for reward. Our salvation was complete the moment we believed and we were placed in the body of Christ and under the blood of Christ. That, that's a once for all transaction. But here we're going to appear and receive our rewards. All right, now let, let's move on to 1 Corinthians, or back rather, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where Paul, I think, lays it out even in clearer language of how we are to labor as believers, getting ourselves in preparation for the day when we will stand before the Bema seat of Christ not to give an account for our sin, they're paid for, but we will give an account to that which we have done as believers. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, dropping down to verse 9. For we are laborers. See that? We are laborers. In other words, in our day-to-day -day existence, we are laborers with God. You are God's husbandry. Now, you know what that means? That means as soon as we entered into that relationship with Christ by virtue of our faith and we became members of the body of Christ who is constantly cultivating us. Well, God is. Just like a farmer who plants his crop. I know maybe some of the wheat farmers in North Dakota like to be able to just harvest their crop and go to Florida and then plant it in the spring and go fishing. Well, they're, they're one of the few that can do that. Most farmers, when they are producing a crop of whatever it is, they have to cultivate it, they have to care for it, they have to fight the bugs and everything else until it's finally consummated and in the bin. All right, now that's exactly what God is doing with us. He is cultivating, He is nurturing every individual believer for his own purpose. See, not ours, but for his. All right, so he says, you are God's building. We're no longer our own, we're his. Now verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me, Paul says, as a wise master builder. Now this would sound a little bit egotistical, except for one fact. Every word that the Apostle Paul writes is Holy Spirit inspired. This does not come from his own feeling. He is not bragging about what he is, but the Holy Spirit is inspiring him to write for our benefit. Now again, just the other day, a young man told me that his pastor had made the comment, as far as he was concerned, they could take Paul's epistles out of the Bible and he'd never miss them. What a travesty. And there's so much of that today. They want to spend all their time in the four Gospels. They want to spend all their time in what Jesus said. Well, you want to remember that this was part and parcel of the problems in the Corinthian church, that they had those divisions. Some were following what Jesus said, what Peter said, what Apollos said, and a few were staying with Paul. 
but they had problems because of it. And I've always made the statement, you've heard me say it, and I suppose you almost get here, uh, tired of hearing me say it. Paul had to constantly defend his apostleship because it was under constant attack. Satanic, to be sure. But here again, the Holy Spirit inspires a man to claim that because of the grace of God, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. He doesn't say he is the foundation. Now be careful. No, Paul is not the basis of our salvation. The foundation is Jesus Christ in verse 11. The other for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, when he laid the foundation, which is the foundation of everything concerning the church age, doctrines and practice and everything else. He built upon it. Other apostles built upon it. The Old Testament prophets and what they wrote, they all add to because everything is fitting together like a hand in glove for the eternal purposes of God. But Paul here makes it so plain that we are part and parcel of building on the foundation that is Christ and the hope of our salvation. All right, now look at verse 12. Now he begins to bring it down to the nitty gritty of everyday Christian experience. Now if any man, oh, I prefer to use the word anyone because I don't want women to think this doesn't apply to me. So if anyone <coughs> build, that is in your daily experiences, if anyone build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Now count a minute. How many materials are listed there? Six. Three that are indestructible by fire or anything else. Gold, silver, and precious stone. The other three are wood, hay, and stubble. They can go up in a puff of smoke, but they are all potential materials for the Christian to use in his daily experience. Think of that. Wood, hay, and stubble, gold, silver, and precious stone. All right, now verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest. What does that mean? It's going to be put in the spotlight. Remember, I'm always explaining that word when something is manifested in Scripture. It is put in the spotlight, and my best definition is when you put a slide under a microscope. You don't see a thing until you do what? Turn on that light. And then the light manifests everything that's on that slide. And until you turn on the light, you don't see a thing. All right, now, all the way through Scripture, things are manifested. What does it mean? God's spotlight is put on it. And there it is. Now, here again, there's going to be something that's going to manifest our works. Now let me take you back to Revelation a minute. All the way back to Revelation, I think it's chapter 19. Yeah, Revelation 19. And just drop in at verse 12. <coughs> Revelation 19, verse 12. Speaking of Christ at His second coming, and his eyes as a flame of fire. Now you see how it helps to be careful how you read? It doesn't say his eyes were flames of fire, but what were they? As, see? In other words, they had that ability to just penetrate through in. Have you ever known people like that who could just penetrate with their eyes? Well, that's just a little preview, but the Lord's eyes will penetrate as flames of fire. Now, fire not only gives light, it also has heat, and as such, now come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, not only does it manifest with the light, but it is also going to show with its heat how much of our works are going to survive. 
Now, if all of our works are nothing but wood, hay, and stubble, how much is going to be left? Nothing. It'll go up in a puff of smoke because of those fiery eyes that are examining our works at the Bema Seat. But all oh, listen, what's going to survive? The gold, the silver, and the precious stone. Fire can't touch it. In fact, it'll enhance it. The light won't hurt it. In fact, it'll enhance it. And so what are we as believers to attempt to constantly do? Don't be all hung up with that which is wood, hay, and stubble. I'd rather have one little diamond as I have a whole lumber yard full of wood, see? And I'd rather have one little piece of gold as a whole bunch of straw. And so here's where we have to set priorities. What are your priorities? Are they just wood, hay, and stubble that won't hold up under those fiery eyes? Or are you going to put forth an effort of quality and get some gold, silver, and precious stone? Now, you know, I've always made the comment to people, that doesn't mean we all have to be a Billy Graham. That doesn't mean we all have to be a foreign missionary. We don't all have to be a Sunday school teacher or a pastor or whatever else. But in whatever area God gives us that gift, and we do it with the right motive, that's where the wood, hay, and stubble, and gold, silver, and precious stones are going to show up. Uh, I remember years ago, and I can say it now because the lady has gone on to be with the Lord, and this is so far back, I don't think anybody will remember her saying, but I mean, it just hit the nail on the head. And we were talking about this one night in just a little home Bible study, about 15 or 20 of us, as to why do we do things, which is supposedly in the service of the Lord. And you may think this is frivolous, but it was true. And it just hit the nail on the head. And this lady, she says, boy, Les, am I ever glad we're talking about this tonight. Because for the next two days, she said, I was going to try and bake 25 pies because their church was going to host a denominational statewide meeting. But she said, I wasn't going to bake those 25 pies just to help the church. She said, I was going to prove to the preacher's wife that I could do more than she was. Now, I say that may sound frivolous, but what did she suddenly realize? Her motive was all wrong, see? Now, there was nothing wrong with doing something to help the church and the particular denominations work. That's fine. But if she was doing it merely to make herself better than someone else, what does it end up as? Wood, hay, and stubble, see? Wood, hay, and stubble. And so many Christians, I'm afraid, are doing the same thing. They, they're busy, busy, busy. They're doing this and they're doing that. But they're not really doing it for the right motive. They're doing it for the sake of other people to see how much they're doing. It'll be wood, hay, and stubble. And I can tell people you can better spend 15 or 20 minutes on your knees in prayer and have nobody aware of what you're doing. And it'll be gold, silver, and precious stone. But all this Frivolous activity will be nothing but wood, hay, and stubble. All right, now let's move on quickly. Our time is going fast. So every man's work shall be made manifest by those fiery eyes of the Lord Jesus who is on the Bema seat for the day, that is, this judgment day of the Bema seat. The day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire, that is, the fiery eyes of the Lord Jesus. And the fire shall try or test every man's work of what sort it is. We've already explained that. Is it going to go up in smoke with wood, hay, and stubble, or will it survive because it's gold, silver, and precious stone? Now verse 14. If any man's work, <coughs> excuse me, if any man's work abide or stays, which he hath built thereupon as a believer, see, he shall receive salvation? No, that's not what it says. He shall receive what? A reward. Now look at that again. I'm in second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. 
reward. Now then, next verse. If any man's work shall be burned. In other words, it's wood, hay, and stubble. He's never had anything that was of the right motive. It was of no consequence. It was wood, hay, and stubble. He shall suffer loss. Not of his salvation, but of what? Reward. All right, and so he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be what? He shall be saved, because after all, he was a believer. He was blood-bought. All right, now read on. So he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. In other words, he's made it, but he's got nothing to show for it. He's saved, he's going to be in glory, but no reward. Now, you see, that's going to be far, far too many believers. They are saved and they're content. They're not going to hell and they're going to heaven when they die. But listen, that's not why God leaves us here. God leaves us here to serve in whatever capacity that may be. And everybody has their own particular gift. I know some people that can go visit the sick and they enjoy every minute of it and they can lift the spirits of those that are sick. Some people can do it. That's not my forte. I know that. Others can go into these nursing homes and they can make those people feel so good. Some people have a gift for it. Others have the gift of prayer. Others have the gift of giving. And others have a gift of, of maybe being good administrators, even in the local church, whatever the case may be. Some have the gift of teaching. Some have other various gifts. But you see, you can determine what you're comfortable with. You don't have to force something. You know, I always have to remember a young lady who got 45, 50 high school and college age kids together every Saturday night in her home for a Bible study. And I'd come in and it was such a thrill to teach those kids. And then one night she had the audacity to say, Les, I wish I had a gift. And I said, land of living, who else could bring in 45, 50 kids every Saturday night like you do? Well, she was flabbergasted. She says, you mean that's a gift? I said, well, if that's not a gift, lady, I don't know what is. And so that's the way you determine your gift. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding, a weekly Bible study. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, a Bible study in your area, or about this program, Write to Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. That's Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. Through the Bible with Les Feldick is viewer supported, and your gift is appreciated. Thank you, and be sure to tune in next time for Through the Bible with Les Feldick.